I want you to understand the difference between its explicit integration and implicit integration. Okay. So have you ever heard those terms before? Explicit time integration or implicit time integration? Okay. Well, they're really common. Uh, and I think if you just, by looking at a really simple example, you can see what distinguishes the two. And then we'll move on and, and, and look at some implementations of explicit and implicit, in, again, in the context of the types of problems we've talked about in this class. So we're going to look at a really simple problem that we want to solve that where we want to solve where x dot is the is you know d x dt all right and we're going to discretize this where we're going to say that t is equal to some discrete time steps. So t0, t0 plus delta t, t0 plus 2 delta t. All right. And so when we do that, and if we use the notation where n is a step in delta t, so So in the discrete form, we have this. Okay. Now let's approximate. By the way, what, what I'm leading to is explicit here. So this this is explicit, right? So now we we have a choice <coughs> in how we approximate this time derivative, right? One choice would be to say that x at n is equal to x n plus 1 minus x n over delta t. Right? That's nothing more than saying delta x over delta t, right? It's just how we define delta x. And so if we substitute this into this equation, we have for, so we're just solving it x n plus 1. So the reason this is called explicit, right? If you look up the word explicit in the dictionary, it's going to say something like to write down plainly. Right? So with this, we can write down plainly the solution at x n plus 1 based on things at x n, right? So n is a step in time that's known, right? Because initially, at n equals 0 initially, right? And so at, at, at time equals 0, we can look around, right? We know what displacements are, what stresses are. We can make some measurements, right? So we can, we can write down plainly. And so, you know, if we, if we use this <coughs> uh, formula to write down the solution at subsequent, you know, iterations in time, and we'll use the assumption that x0 this is equal to a constant. Then we'd have x1 equals delta t back t0 c c. So, you know, x1 we can write down based on things that were initially given. Okay? x2 we can write down based on x1. So we do the computation at x1 based on things that we know, 
And now we know everything to define x2. And now we know everything to define x3, and so on. And we just keep marching on in time that way. Now, that's so easy, you might ask, why wouldn't we always do it that way? Right. Well, let's look why we may not do it. Let's attempt to solve this equation given the method, the explicit method we just talked about. Um, if we assume that x at 0 equals c, and we know this thing has the, I mean, this is the write down, right? We know this, the exact solution to this is this guy. Right. And we also know that this is only stable if the real part of lambda is less than or equal to zero. Meaning, when I say stable, I mean that solutions or trajectories x and t x of t decay or don't grow unboundedly. Right. This is only true if the real part of lambda is less than or equal to zero. So with our numerical scheme, So in order to write down any arbitrary x n plus 1 step based on x0, we would be left with this relationship. And the only way that x n plus 1 will not grow infinitely is that for that to be true. And so if we solve this for delta t, we end up with this. So in order for this explicit scheme to be stable, this has to hold, or the time step is restricted to this relationship, okay? Now, physically, what is lambda? Well, in, in this equation, you could recognize it as, a, as an eigenvalue. Like from the continuous equation, you, you notice that it's an eigenvalue. And in mechanics, at least, eigenvalues are associated with the fundamental frequencies of vibration. Right? So if you think about a, a, a beam that's vibrating, we can solve for its eigenvalues, and those will give us the, the resonant frequencies of vibration. <coughs> <coughs> and in a finite element solution, it turns out that those resonant frequencies are related to the, they're related to the wave speed of the material. So the wave speed is like the square root of the Young's modulus over the density. So it's the speed a uh, longitudinal wave propagates through, through something. So the wave speed over the length of the element, right? So think about a mechanics problem where the material is steel. And I just use steel because I happen to know the wave speed off the top of my head. It's, it's about 5,050 meters per second. So now, now imagine you have really small elements, right? And you have this really fast wave speed. That means you're 
you know, for a typical simulation, think of like, um, you know, the type, the size of elements you might use to discretize a drill bit. Right? To 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 capture all the features around the bit, you know, your elements are going to have to be on the order of millimeters, right, to get convergent solutions. So now you have an, an element that's say one millimeter, and you divide that by 5,000 meters per second. Your stable time step is going to be on the order of like. 10 to the minus 8, right? Or 7. So if you want to solve a problem that, you know, could you imagine solving a, an entire drilling simulation where you have to take steps of, you know, I'm talking about the entire simulation, like, <laughs> you know, the, the whole thousand, you know, several thousand feet down, several thousand feet horizontal. You're going to solve every, every bit of it with an explicit simulation where you're having to take t steps in time to the minus eight. Right? And unfortunately, time steps are not something we can paralyze. We can paralyze space, right? We can, we can take a body and we can break it up into different pieces and we can send those off to different computers to work on simultaneously. But, but time, by its nature, is something that's sequential. Right? So the best we can do is just step along. And anyway, the point is that would take a really, really long time uh, to run that type of simulation. Right? So, Explicit dynamic simulations are typically used in high rate phenomena, things that only happen for a few microseconds, because th those are what are reasonably approachable with these type of simulations. So like in my old business where I did penetration mechanics and impact uh, at Sandia, this is the type of simulations we ran. Also car crash simulations are explicit dynamics. and. Earthquake, uh, to give you a, a geomechanics example, earthquake simulations, the first you know, few microseconds of an earthquake, you, you can model with an uh, implicit dynamic simulation. Okay? So if we're not going to use explicit, what, what else would we use? So an implicit... We're going to approximate the time derivative like this. So if you remember before, we had xn plus 1, xn plus 1 minus xn. So now we have xn, xn, okay. And we plug that into our equation. Solve for xn. Okay, but it's not really xn that we're wanting to solve for, it's xn plus 1. So we're just going to increment all the n's, right? So then we'll just have, we're just going to add 1 to n. We could do that because n is just some arbitrary step. Okay, so now we, you can see that this is implicit, right? It's not written down plainly. We have x n plus one on both sides of the equation. And if if f is a linear function, then then we can solve for it, you know. And if, if x is in this case just one dimensional, it's no problem. Uh, but if it's a vector, that means we have to invert a matrix. Right? So if f is a nonlinear function now. Then we can't, you know, we can't solve for it in a straightforward manner. We, we have to resort to nonlinear solution techniques. Okay. But the benefit is that if we go back and look at our this problem. We solve it with our implicit method now, 
In this case, it is linear, so we can In terms of x0, and this equation is stable as long as this is true. And that's That's always true. Is there any value of lambda that that would not be true? I'm sorry, uh, yeah. Any value of delta t, that would not be true. It's always true. And so the advantage here is that we can take an arbitrary large time step when we do an implicit calculation. But with an implicit calculation, each step is more expensive, right? Because we have to solve this implicit system of, you know, implicit equation. In one dimension, it's no problem, right? But in higher dimensions, this means inverting a matrix, which is expensive, right? So what we, we, we buy in, in implicit methods, we buy enhanced stability for, uh, you know, in the ability to take a larger time step for more computation per time step. And then, you know, explicit methods, the, the computation per time step is trivial, but we have to take lots of little tiny ones for stability. And what I wrote down, keep in mind, is for linear problems. These theories extend to nonlinear problems with care. <laughs> so a lot of times when we go to nonlinear problems, um, like for instance with a stable time step calculation in explicit dynamics, if it's truly nonlinear, uh, if, you lose, if you use the linear time step derivation, then and you, and you run it at that, you're probably going to get an unstable solution. So usually we use a safety factor. So we compute it, we compute the time step for a linear problem, stable time step for a linear problem, and then we back it down a little bit to be safe, to ensure stability. Because, and believe me, it's happened to me, the worst thing in the world is you have a simulation running for like two weeks, and then it goes unstable. <laughs> This happens in impact a lot. You have a lot of compression, right? Your stable time steps are changing because your element size, you're compressing your elements, right? So now your element links are getting smaller. <coughs> Wave speed's still the same. So the time step's going down and down and down. <coughs> and, you know, we compute it, update it frequently in those simulations. You're always computing it. <coughs> but again, those computations are based on linear theory. And it doesn't always extend to highly nonlinear problems. <coughs> so 